Hello everyone and welcome back to Arise and Shine. I'm excited to be with you again this week. I hope you've had a blessed week since our last uh, little talk. So today I wanted to, or what I feel God put on my heart, is to talk about endurance. So I wanted to start by reading from Hebrews uh, 12, verse 1 to 16, but why don't we open in prayer first. So Lord, we come before you and we thank you, Lord, again for this new day that you have made for us to rejoice and be glad in. We thank you for your word today. We just ask that it will touch each one of our hearts and change us to help us to be more like you, Lord God. We just give you ourselves. We ask for your forgiveness if we've sinned against you in any way, Lord God. And we just want to thank you for your presence. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I wanted you to start by reading um, Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 16. And I'm going to be using the Passion Translation. Um, I'm just, I've just had a lot of joy reading that one lately. Uh, it gives you, as I said, a little bit of a different look at things. So it's called The Great Cloud of Witnesses. As for us, we have all we have all of these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds. So we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and every sin that so easily fall we so easily fall into. Then we will be able to run life's marathon race with passion and determination for the path has been already marked out before us. We look away from the natural realm and we fasten our gaze on to Jesus, who birthed faith within us, and who leads us forward into faith's perfection. His example is this, because his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his, he endured the agony of the cross, and conquered its humiliation, and now sits exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. So consider carefully how Jesus faced such intense opposition from sinners who oppose their own souls, so that you won't become worn down and cave in under life's pressures. After all, you have not yet reached the point of sweating blood in your opposition to sin. And have you forgotten his encouraging words spoken to you as his children? He said, My child, don't underestimate the value of the discipline and training of the Lord God, or get depressed when he has to correct you. For the Lord's training of your life is the evidence of his faithful love. And when he draws you to himself, he proves you are his delightful child. Fully embrace God's correction as part of your training. For he is doing what any loving father does for his children. For who has ever heard of a child who never had to be corrected? We all should welcome God's discipline as the validation of authentic sonship. For if we have never once endured his correction, it only proves we are strangers and not sons. And isn't it true that we respect our earthly fathers, even though they corrected and disciplined us? Then we should demonstrate as even greater respect for God, our spiritual father, as we submit to his life-giving discipline. Our parents corrected us for the short time of our childhood as it seemed good to them. But God corrected us throughout our lives for our own good, giving us an invitation to share his holiness. Now, all discipline seems to be more than pain, more pain than pleasure at the time. Yet later, it will produce a transformation of character, bringing a harvest of righteousness and peace to those who yield it. So be made strong even in your weakness by lifting up your tired hands in prayer and worship and strengthening your weak knees. For as you keep walking toward, forward on God's path, all your stumbling ways will be divinely healed. In every relationship, be swift to choose peace over competition and run swiftly towards holiness. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Watch over each other to make sure that no one misses the revelation of God's grace. And make sure no one lives with a root of bitterness sprouting within them, which will only cause trouble and poison the hearts of many. Be careful that no one among you lives in immorality 
becoming careless about, about God's blessings. I'm going to end at that verse number 16 right now. But I just wanted to go on and speak a little bit about a few things that I feel that the Lord has put on my heart. So endurance. Endurance is to bear up under a weight. That weight could be fatigue. It could be stress. It could be adverse conditions. It could be sin that so easily entangles us. And that's in, in Hebrews 12 verse 1. But endurance is patient, strength, preparedness, and focus. I have a couple of runner stories that I want to share with you today. I have a couple of daughters who are actually runners. And um, so I wanted to share this one uh, first. And it's about a gentleman named Colin Wood. Sorry, Colin. No, Cliff. Colin's the other one. Cliff Young is this one. I'm sorry. So every year in Australia, it, they host an ultra marathon. And that distance is 875 kilometers. And it's an endurance that races from Sydney to Melbourne. It is considered among the world's most grueling ultra marathons. The race takes five days to complete, and it's normally only attempted by world class athletes who train specifically for the event. These athletes are typically less than 30 years old and backed by large companies such as Nike. In 1983, a man named Cliff Young showed up at the start of this race. Cliff was a 61-year-old man who was a potato and sheep farmer, and he wore overalls and work boots. To everyone's shock, Cliff wasn't there to be a spectator. He picked up his race number and joined the other runners. The press and other athletes became curious and questioned Cliff. They told him, you're crazy. There's no way you can finish this race. To which he replied, yes, I can. See, I grew up on a farm where we couldn't afford horses and tractors. And the whole time I was growing up, whenever the storms would roll in, I'd have to go out and round up the sheep. We had 2,000 sheep and 2,000 acres. Sometimes I would have to run those sheep for two or three days. It took a long time, but I always catch them. I believe I can run this race. When the race started, the pros quickly left Cliff behind. The crowds and the television audience were entertained because Cliff didn't seem even to run properly. He appeared to shuffle. Many even feared for the old farmer's safety. All of the athletes knew that it took about five days to finish the race. In order to complete, to compete, one had to run about 18 hours a day and sleep the remaining hours. The thing is, Cliff Young didn't know that. When the morning of the second day came, everyone was in for another surprise. Not only was Cliff still in the race, he had continued jogging all night. Cliff kept running. Each night, he came a little closer to the, to the leading pack. By the final night, he had surpassed all of the young world-class athletes. He was the first competitor to cross the finish line and set a new course record. When Cliff was awarded the winning prize of $10,000, he said he didn't know there was a prize and insisted that he did not enter it for the money and he ended up giving all of his winnings to the next five runners who crossed the finish line. What a story that is. To never give up, but to also to face the impossible. But I also thought about, you know, the words of the ridicule that he had from those who tried to discourage him from trying. Often we have that in life. But you know, I noticed also in the story that he did not compare himself to everyone else. He was on his own mission. And that's how we should be in our journey of life with the Lord. We, need, we cannot despise the race that is set before us. Um, we need to run that race with uh, encouragement and endure the race that the Lord has set before us. The, ne the neat thing about Cliff is he just didn't stop. Um, he didn't let the devil try to make him stop or convince him that he was never going to uh, cross the finish line. He just said, I'm going to keep going 
And that's how we need to be in our walk with the Lord as well, is to keep on going, keep on believing, keep on focused on God, keep on praying, keep on worshiping, keep on moving in on in, in with God and not stop, but keep trusting. Another little story that I had was my daughters who run. Um, my one daughter, I think she ran her first half marathon about four years ago. And in order to do that, she uh, got a coach and was training and uh, did did was very apprehensive when she faced her first, you know, 21.2 or 21.4 kilometer race. Um, that was in Niagara Falls. And my husband and I went down to cheer her on and to be there for her. And um, she said to us before she ran the race that this was probably the only one that she would ever do. That day it was raining and it was not a really nice day out. But anyways, we brought her to the finish line or to the to start line. I wish we'd brought her to the finish line. We 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 got her to the start line and there was like thousand people there. Um, it was very crowded and off she went. And she ran and ran and ran. And we had, I had tried to meet her at different points to cheer her on. And um, I remember being at about maybe three kilometers from the end point or the finish line um, to see her and, uh, you know, to encourage her and all the other runners to keep going because it's quite a feat to run a half marathon and focus. And if you ever are encountered with someone who's running a marathon, please cheer them on because it really helps them move. I know that my daughter said that but um she said at mile 17 or uh kilometer 17 she felt like giving up because she didn't think she could ever finish but she kept on facing it and she kept on enduring and she ended up crossing that finish line um, made us so proud as her as her parents um i can't remember exactly what her time was but it was like two hours and nine minutes or something so it was she she beat the goal that she set for herself for the amount of time that it would take her to run so that was an amazing beginning. And then she said, you know, it was really hard to run and I don't think I'll ever do it again. But when you know, within a couple months, she'd signed up for another one. And uh, she continues to run to this day. And that's about four years later. Last year, she went to the Detroit Half Marathon, which you cross the, the Windsor Tunnel Bridge. And uh, that was kind of a little bit scary for us because she was running half in Canada and half in the U.S. So she went with two or three of her friends that are from the running group. And when they went to pick up their race gear uh, the day before the run, they met this uh, senior lady who was uh, very gray haired, um, found out later that she was 88 years old and that she had started running when she was 50. And she had done many, many half marathons. She was there to pick up her race gear. And I believe that the Lord put that woman there to encourage the younger runners that um, nothing is impossible. Um, the 88-year-old lady was a, a retired nun. And uh, she ran um, for the Lord, she said. And she hoped to continue doing that for many, many years. But wow, she was 88 years old. You know, most runners, um, and she actually ran that half marathon came across the finish line, that old, the older 88 year old, and uh, made it in good time. I think her time was like four hours, something like that. But anyways, my hat off to her, because wow, I'm not a runner. I love power walking. I'm a speed walker, um, and I walk pretty at a pretty good clip. So that's my equivalent to running. Um, but there's many who run and really enjoy it. But anyways, most coaches, most runners have a coach. My daughter has a coach. Um, and though you don't need to have a coach because, you know, this, uh, this 99, not 88 year old nun, um, she did not have a coach and Cliff Young never had a coach either, but you know, it's, it's, it helps when you have a coach, um, to be able to do, you know, wear the right gear, keep up the pace, be encouraged, little pep talks from the coach. And, you know, our coach, we have the ultimate coach in life on our journey, our marathon of life. And our coach is the Lord, our Savior. And he is the ultimate coach. And he's given us his word, his church, his truth, and the blessing of fellow believers to help us to cross this finish line in this journey of our life. We have to flex our muscles. We have to flex our muscles of faith, our muscles of focus, and our muscles of finish to cross that finish line. And we have to remember that every day, that the enemy, the enemy seeks who he can devour. And I looked up 1 Peter 5 and 8 in the Amplified Version, and it says in there, 
Be sober, well-balanced, and self-disciplined. Be alert and cautious at all times. That enemy of yours, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, fiercely hungry, seeking someone to devour. Don't let that person be you. I think about our Lord and Savior Jesus and how he endured so much in his walk on earth. The 40 days in the desert being tempted by the devil. The Garden of Gethsemane. He endured Peter denying him, one of his friends. The soldiers that mocked and whipped him. He endured the nails on the cross. He endured taking our sin upon himself. And he endured to the finish. He endured the finish and he said it is finished. We need to live our day, our lives every day knowing that it is finished. He paid for our sin. He paid for our freedom. He paid for our eternity on that cross. And he never gave up. We can cross that finish line just like Jesus and not grow weary. Sometimes, you know, my daughter was on another, it's called a Ragnar race, and that was in uh, Michigan. And she went there with a group of people that make a team, and they were to run for 24 hours. 24 hours, long run. So that means you're running, and they do like a relay team. So I think each person had to run like seven or eight kilometers at a time, and then they would um, rest, and then their turn would come up next. Well, she was running, and it made me as her mom a little nervous, because she was running in Michigan, and it was a dark, and it was a forest. And, um, you know, in that Ragnar race of 24 hours of running, there was a dark forest, and there was tree roots. And, you know, I was thinking about, you know, could a bear come after her, or something worse? Um, but she said, you know, it's, it's not fun running in the dark all by yourself. Um, and there was a couple of girls who were really afraid to run that stretch. And so my daughter actually did run that stretch, but she did end up falling when she tripped on a tree root and broke one of her fingers, but she got up and she kept on going. She got up after her fall and she kept on going. She kept the focus that she didn't, first of all, want to let her team down. Um, she didn't want to let herself down either. But, you know, in our, in our race of life, we don't want to let the Lord down. We don't want to let others who we love down and especially the Lord. So, you know, sometimes our journey in life is like going through a dark forest in the middle of the night with tree roots that want to make us stumble. And then the enemy's there prowling to see who he can devour. Wow. Have you thought of it that way? That life comes sometimes can be so hard. It's like running that Ragnar race and you're all by yourself and you're in the dark. You know, when you have a team to cheer you on, it sure makes the running easier and helps you to know that all things are possible. All things are possible with the Lord, our Savior, and he has good plans in store for you. So hang on in the race that you're running right now in your life. Walk that or run that race in faith, in believing. At the beginning of the year, I really believe that the Lord showed me a few things, and that was a lot of words that start with the letter P that I have kind of brought into my prayers. And some of the P words are in preparation, right, for the day, in preparation for the journey, in preparation for eternity. So some of my P words are as I call out for the Lord's presence, in prayer and in praise. I rely on the Lord's promises from his word, his purposes for my life. I rely on his power because he is all powerful and all knowing. I rely on his protection as I did when I had to pray for my daughter in that dark race in Michigan. I rely on him for his peace in this journey. I rely on him for the passion, the passion that I have for him, my only hope and my only savior, that my heart will be passionate for him. I rely on him with my prayers to walk in purity before him. I rely on him to provide for me. And I ask that for my family and my church. 
And in his word, it says he wants us to have and enjoy life. He wants us to prosper. So I rely on him to help me prosper. I know with my God, there are endless possibilities. So possibilities is another one of my P words. Gives me great joy to use these words in my prayers to the Lord. Gives me great strength. God stirs it up in me. God is good. So a couple more things that I had today before I end off. And one of them, or two of them, is one is from my one of my favorite authors, and her name is Anne Boskamp. And Anne Boskamp is an Ontarian. I believe she lives just outside of Listowel. And she has written a number of books um, with the Lord's direction. Some of them have been New York bestsellers, and I have a few of them. But I was reading one of her little devotionals um, uh, a few days ago, and it said, so yeah, so maybe some of us really blew it this week. In a thousand little painful ways, Lord. We hurt people we wish we'd helped. We didn't do things we wish we had. Some saw things through the lens of judgment rather than through the eyes of Jesus. Listen to some things defensively instead of simply with humility. We walk straight through some things when it would have been better to just kneel down right there and pray. Falling short can hurt longer than anyone else ever knows. But you know what? The Lord cups our face like a little child and looks us straight in the eye so that we can feel all our hurting bones and our aching hearts that he will give us peace. We are held close by his arms of grace because his grace is new every day. God's grace, grace and more grace. What a wonderful savior that we have. So a couple of things I wanted to end with today, and one of them is Galatians uh, 6. Galatians 6, and I'm going to read verse 9 and 10. And it says in there, And don't allow yourselves to be weary or disheartened in planting good seeds for the season of reaping, and the har the wonderful harvest you've planted is coming. Take advantage of every opportunity to be a blessing to others, especially to our brothers and sisters in the family of faith. Wow. I have a little song and I wanted to uh, do the do the uh, share that with you at the end of this video. And it's called New Today. New Today is a song that is just it just talks about the Lord's goodness and how his mercies are new every morning. So I encourage you at the end of this video to click on the link that will be provided and you can listen to the words and the music and worship. It's called New Today. And often, you know, we feel in our life that we blew it. We've let the Lord down. But you know what? His grace and mercies are new every day. And once we come to the Lord and we ask for forgiveness or ask the Lord to help us to make something right, we have to then walk in trust and put that behind us. Don't keep carrying yesterday on your shoulders because yesterday is over and you only need, if you've done things wrong, you only need to bring it to the Lord and ask him to forgive you and to help you to make things right. So in the song new today, I've been hard on myself lately. Every morning I feel the weight. When it's hard to just get out of bed, tell my heart, because sometimes I forget, that your mercies are new today. Your mercies are new today. I can rest on your shoulders. There is grace to start over. Your mercies are new today. Your mercies are new today. Help me rise like the morning sun. Help me see that your work's not done. When I'm less than I want to be, Lord, I need you to keep reminding me. Your mercies are new today. I kept thinking you were angry, but you were fighting just to hold me and pick me up every time I felt. If your love is here to lift me and your blood says you forgive me, show me how I can forgive myself.
because your mercies are new today. Your mercies are new again and again. Your mercies are new today. I can rest on your shoulders. There is grace to start over. Your mercies are new today. Oh, new today. I can rest on your shoulders. There is grace to start over. Your mercies are new today. So I found this little thing, a couple of things I want to end with is prayer and this little this little clip that I had. And it says on here, forget yesterday. It has already forgotten you. Don't sweat tomorrow. You haven't even met. You haven't even. Uh, sorry. You haven't even met. Instead, open your eyes and your heart to a truly precious gift today. A truly precious gift today. Yep, his mercies are new every day. So I want to end our time together by saying, bless you in the name of the Lord. And I just wanted to end with prayer. His mercies are new every day. Dear Lord, we join our faith together, moving forward in the face of tremendous uncertainty with this pandemic. But we are confident of your favor. We thank you for your Holy Spirit within us and in your coming, your Holy Spirit in our going, and in our moments of sadness, our moments of weeping, our moments of mourning, and in our moments of rejoicing. You were here with us last year. You were here with us yesterday. You are here with us now. Thank you, Lord. You'll be there tomorrow. We give you the glory. And we thank you that if you are not, that if you are for us, you are greater than anything against us, Lord. The gates of hell will not prevail. They cannot prevail. No weapon formed against your people will prosper in the name of Jesus. We stand as a testimony and we give you praise and thanksgiving. In the name of Jesus and amen. Be blessed, arise and shine, endure and know that his grace are new every morning. Bless you until next week.